without further ado, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I, uh, we th I think many of you are from across the state. Um, so welcome to our Dallas chapter uh, monthly meeting. Uh, this evening we have um, Adam Black. Uh, he's gonna talk to us about um, rare uh, Blackland Prairie um, plants. He is a lifelong plant enthusiast with a passion for rare and unusual and esoteric plants. He's based in Navasota. He combines his experience in the fields of botany and horticulture by promoting diverse landscapes uh, while also collaborating with various gardens and universities, collecting imperiled plant species for the purposes of research and ex situ conservation. He is self-employed as a botanical horticultural consultant while also serving as program coordinator for the Smithsonian-led Global Genome Initiative for Gardens. He previously worked at several botanical gardens, most notably as director of the John Ferry Garden, formerly Peckerwood Garden in Hempstead, where he assisted with the transition of this internationally acclaimed private garden into a public garden. Originally from Florida, he previously managed the forest pathology and forest Etymology Laboratories at the University of Florida and with his late wife owned a collector oriented mail order nursery that introduced many new plants now preserved ex situ in botanical collections and general horticulture from Adams international and domestic explorations. So everybody uh, help me welcome Adam Black. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm actually surprised that I uh, have this many folks uh, on such a unusual uh, uh, unusual day, I guess we can call it. And uh, Did I hit you hopefully everybody me? is uh, staying here. safe here. You have a problem sharing me? Can you all hear me? You're sounding yes, good. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and that's one thing too. I was a little bit, I, when I was listening to y'all earlier, I, things were a little bit choppy. So I don't know if that's my Wi-Fi here or not. I know when I was calling my mom to check on her today a couple of times, there were some issues with the cell service, which my Wi-Fi is through. So hopefully we won't get too interrupted here. But um, but yeah, I, uh, um, when, when uh, I, I think it was uh, Sandy contacted me about uh, speaking for y'all here. Uh, she uh, just basically left open to me to uh, talk about anything regarding Blackland Prairie. And uh, I must say that uh, my experience is more with the uh, Blackland Prairies that we have down in my neck of the woods here, down kind of Brazos County and uh, um, all the surrounding areas here. But uh, not that I haven't seen uh, the Blackland Prairies up near you all but um, really haven't spent enough time up there. I mean, there's a lot of overlap in the, in the uh, plants that you can find uh, in both locations, but um, there are some distinctive things in each of our locations too. So uh, um, a lot of this will be applicable to your area, but there may be a few kind of localized things that uh, uh, can only be found some of the fragmentary uh, um, black land prairie remnants in, in, uh, in this area here. But uh, yeah, Cindy uh, introduced me um, pretty thoroughly, but um, um, so I don't need to go through this very much here. But yeah, I, uh, whenever, when I moved to Texas, one of the uh, ecoregions I just really fell in love with was, uh, well, I fell in love with all of them, but uh, the Blackland Prairie was uh, um, a, a particular interest to me. It's just, uh, even in winter, just like, this photo here, you just go out and you have all these just wonderful colors and textures and um, and then spring ensues and just all these things are coming out of the woodwork flowering and just full of diversity if you can really find a good, um, hey, reasonably intact. Yes. Uh, your screen, we only have you on video, no shared screen. Oh. So we're not seeing the lovely pictures you're describing. Oh, okay. Let me see what's going on here. Did it just disappear? Has it just not been up? Not been up. Oh. It was shared before, wasn't it? It was. I guess it, huh. Let me see here. Get back to. Let 
Okay, try it again here. There Perfect. You, you see it now? Okay. Well, good. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, yeah, I was basically on this slide here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm guessing a lot of you already know what uh, characterizes uh, Blackland Prairie. And uh, um, I think, uh, obviously, due to the name Blackland, it, uh, they all tend to have this kind of dark soil, a kind of clay base, really fine grained and uh, um, fairly moisture retentive uh, with a lot of organic material and sometimes a lot of uh, carbon from the past uh, fires that maintain the prairies there. Um, usually have a little bit of an alkalinity con content, but um, there is no real one soil type that characterizes all the different areas. It's kind of an aggregate of, uh, of uh, different soil types that all look fairly similar. Not all of them are black or kind of grayish like this. Some of them can be uh, other colors too, but, um, but yeah, the, most of the soil types that uh, maybe all are familiar with are, do tend to be those kind of darker colored ones. Um, a lot of you may have seen maps like this that show the Blackland Prairie ecoregion, but uh, um, Blackland Prairie remnants actually extend all the way into Georgia. A lot of people don't know that. There are some very fragmentary uh, um, sections of it that were actually just kind of recently characterized in Georgia that, that they, they just basically found some unique flora that uh, uh, in, in geology that uh, was basically congruent with uh, what we find here uh, further west. Um, and, ba and basically every state in between Georgia and uh, Texas here, we, there, there are uh, remnant blackland prairies. A lot of it is gone, unfortunately, but um, you can, can still find some spots that uh, um, that do exist. And also you don't wanna go by just this map here where the, the green areas are shaded in. There are other fragmentary uh, um, black land prairie remnants in, in many of these other counties too in between on either sides of these uh, little green strips here. Um, but uh, definitely the ecoregion itself is, uh, um, I guess, pretty much delineated by these, uh, um, by the, the shaded areas on the maps. So this is a kind of a typical prairie in summer um, down near me. This is actually in Walker County, um, just kind of the um, northeast of uh, College Station. And uh, you may recognize some of the plants in there, but uh, one of the things that are lacking and, and why uh, a lot of these plants are kind of of uh, conservation interest is uh, a lot of these places just don't get the necessary fire that they uh, used to get to, to, to be managed properly. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of invasive grasses or just even the native grasses too can just uh, uh, become too overgrown. It of course suppresses a lot of the uh, other diversity that wants to be growing in there that needs to have kind of a a more open uh, layer on the ground to be able to have enough light to start out as a seedling and uh, not be outcompeted by some of the more aggressive things. So uh, this is actually my property here. I, uh, I'm not technically Blackland Prairie, but I do have uh, some prairie areas that I'm trying to restore here through uh, fire and, uh, and other means. I do have a lot of uh, exotic grasses, but the more I've been keeping up on top of this, uh, it, it's just amazing how much better and better it gets every single year. But um, a lot of places, even though they may be technically preserved, they may not be getting these uh, um, fire uh, regimes as often as they should. So some of them still are not the healthiest. And then there's other places too that are uh, um, just roadside prairie remnants. The, the, some of these places are just uh, gold for diversity when uh, like you can see, right on the other side of the fence there in that uh, field there, it's either overgrazed or they're regularly mowing it for hay or, or both. Um, and uh, there's nothing over there, but in this one strip here between the road and in that uh, um, private land over there, you, you have just all this wonderful stuff coming up here. And uh, um, you can oftentimes find some, some real treasures in these little sections here. 
Um, you can see lo looking off in the distance, uh, it, we're kind of on a hill here and it, it kind of slopes down in the back there. All this stuff here is just congregated on top of this one little little hill here in uh, Washington County, just to the, the south of me. These are all uh, the uh, Echinacea atrubens, and you can see some other things in there, the blue bonnets and, and other stuff. But uh, like I saw uh, two years ago down the road from me um, in, um, uh, Montgomery County, there was a site that was very similar to this. And they did some, I'm not sure exactly what they did. I thought they were going to be widening the road, but uh, um, they just totally scraped the entire roadside where there was just all sorts of really wonderful things. And uh, I, I figured everything was gone. But um, um, surprisingly, next year, a few things still popped up that uh, had always been there. Um, still want to watch it just to see how, how things do but you never know what's going to happen to these little micro sites here they uh, very well could be uh, paved over when roads need to be widened or may not be managed properly or who knows um, it's uh, very easy to to lose these little things so that's why I like to uh, uh, kind of uh, go around and make sure to ethically propagate some of the things that need to be backed up in other places. And so we, when we talk about conservation, I think a lot of people kind of their minds gravitate only towards either just preserving the land or a particular species where it grows. Um, a lot of people don't really think about exit to conservation, which is uh, actually propagating these uh, um, plants and getting them distributed around to safe sites, be it a botanical garden or some other uh, applicable um, institution that can properly curate these things. They'll, they'll keep all the records on where each of the different uh, uh, plants were collected from. So like for a particular species, uh, these gardens will have, uh, or at least strive to have genetics from throughout that, um, um, that, that species of conservation concern throughout its range. So not just from one site or one plant of that species, uh, that's not really true conservation. You wanna have as much genetics backed up elsewhere as possible. Um, one thing uh, that really hit home with me when I managed the, uh, when I was working at the uh, University of Florida, managing the forest pathology and forest entomology laboratories, and we collaborated with all sorts of other uh, organizations and departments within the university too that were conservation based. Um, we, we were always of course working on the disease issues and the pest issues, but it's it was just shocking when I really entered that field to see how many new diseases, new insect vectors are being are coming into the country here on a very regular basis. And it's just a, basically a ticking time bomb that we, uh, as, as far as when that next disease is going to come and basically um, really impact severely a particular species. A lot of these fungi that come from other countries and cause problems here or insects that carry a particular disease, they're oftentimes very focused on one particular species or a particular plant family. So you never know when these things are just suddenly going to all of a sudden start disappearing. And it's a different situation, especially in these very fragile habitats like the Blackland Prairies, where we only really have fragments of what really once was. So I consider those uh, just of great importance, even if they're not a endangered species, uh, they still, if they're only found at a few sites, they, I, I feel that these need to be really uh, backed up somewhere else just to preserve that material, not knowing the, the future of those places. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, conservation can be other things too, like uh, uh, preservation of genetic material it doesn't need to necessarily be living material um, on site or in a safe site. It can be uh, preserving the, uh, the genetic material like uh, I now uh, work with the Global Genome Initiative, uh, which is a Smithsonian based uh, project that's aiming to uh, basically preserve uh, uh, tissue of all uh, of at least one genus of every organism on earth um, and then basically make that available to any researcher that wants to use that for their work and uh, generating genomes and uh, other molecular studies. Um, so 
oftentimes you get a lot of these weird little endemics that are only found in these remaining little microsites. And so those are very important too, to conserve that material as well before something happens and they're all gone. And seed banking too, that's another kind of uh, extra set of insurance, extra insurance for basically uh, preserving this material too, for things that have seeds that can be stored in those conditions. There are a number of plants too that have uh, uh, seeds that just really can't be dried out or just can't be preserved with any of the, the modern methods that we have of, uh, of storage. So that's where the botanic gardens come in to uh, um, basically preserve living collections of as much genetics as possible. And then of course you want to have like nurseries that are propagating things, uh, preferably from local source for restoration of some of these sites as uh, some land gets bought up by uh, maybe governmental institutions or other places that want to basically restore it to what it originally looked like. Um, so someone needs to actually be doing that. And there are uh, nurseries out there that do focus on that sort of thing, but you need to collect from the wild too to be able to have that material. So um, it's uh, got to come from somewhere. And, and I, there is controversy over this, but uh, I really think one of the best things um, that can be done for preservation of, uh, especially a lot of rare plant material is get it in the hands of private citizens. Um, a lot, there are a lot of botanical gardens out there that just for whatever reason, I don't know why they think it's just, uh, um, uh, just totally wrong for some of these rare plants to not be in the hands of private citizens who are interested in want to learn from them want to maybe uh, restore their own property. Um, there's just this whole keep rare plants rare type of philosophy that I do not understand or people don't want these things entering the nursery trade and people profiting off of them. There's also a attitude that profiting off of natural resources is just evil in itself for some reason when nurseries don't really make any money in the first place. So, uh, but I know a lot of you, I mean, especially with the Native Plant Society chapter do have plant sales and promote these things. So I know uh, this isn't really directed at uh, any of you all, but there is that attitude out there. And so uh, um, just in the, in the things I do, I have to, I do have to field these different uh, ways of thinking here. Um, so it is, uh, it is a challenge sometimes. And so, yeah, let's take your kind of coordinated conservation efforts, just things I've been doing lately involving specifically the black land prairie plants. I, I do all sorts of things all over the state, especially a lot in West Texas with oaks for the Global Conservation Consortium for Oaks and uh, um, orchid work with Longwood Gardens. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about some orchids a little bit later because some of those are from the black land prairie here. Um, USDA, uh, we've been working on, uh, hopefully next year, their COVID's kind of uh, put a damper on it this past year here, but Monarda Lindheimeri, Lindheimer's bee balm, um, does occur in Blackland Prairie areas and uh, is one of their targets for uh, uh, basically seed banking from as many populations as possible. Um, just because even though it is fairly widespread, it is still a very localized uh, thing where you find it. Um, and so, uh, as I was looking around surveying sites, I, uh, well, we'll talk about the hybrid complexes a little bit later, but that's part of the puzzle too. Um, but yeah, there, we don't need to go through the whole list here. I want to get to some actual plants here, but did want to mention the uncoordinated conservation efforts because, um, even though, uh, a lot of the, the projects, uh, on the coordinated list are basically grant funded projects that I get uh, involved with, with collaborators. I'm always just, again, I'm a nerd. I'm always out uh, just kind of exploring in my free time too. And if I see something that uh, I can legally collect, um, be it property that I have permission to be on or uh, um, get all the proper authorizations uh, for uh, whatever the uh, land manager uh, uh, is of that property, I will just go ahead and collect things while I'm there, again, in an ethical manner, not uh, stripping everything that uh, to, to prevent any natural recruitment on site. But uh, I just kind of do this on my own time. I don't make any money at it. That's just one of those things I just, I'm there, I might as well do it. So, but uh, a lot of the things we collect is seed, but um, 
um, in some cases, uh, you do find certain things where uh, you can't really uh, either have a really bad year, there's no seed, especially when you have visiting collaborator, collaborators, and you think you know when the right time for them to fly in and go check a population for seed, and then you get there and realize that, that uh, um, they just didn't produce that year, or there was some other issue, maybe the site got burned, which was a good thing for the site, but not necessarily for the seed we wanted to collect. So occasionally we will collect uh, vegetative material, not whole plants, but uh, either cuttings or just uh, material that we can uh, uh, collect and, and propagate for uh, um, for, re for purposes of uh, reproducing them. And sometimes it's not very glamorous. We'll like, this was a uh, uh, plant collections collaborative trip that was a uh, uh, basically headed up by Chicago Botanic Garden and we were traveling all around uh, East Texas and Central Texas and collecting seeds and we would spend the night in hotel rooms collect, uh, cleaning all the seed and counting it and very tedious. Here we're doing, I think these were all Echinacea uh, atrorubin seeds that we were cleaning on someone's hotel bed here. Um, actually, yeah, there was a test kerosene from Chanticleer on the right there and that's Boyce Tankersley in the back there from Chicago Botanic. But uh, yeah, there was very informal process here. Um, and we do collect our barium specimens of everything that we uh, that we do collect uh, propagation material of. And we get those uh, um, usually either the, the visiting collaborator who is uh, working with this material will, will want some just to, of course, verify ID, get it. Uh, either in their own uh, herbaria or uh, uh, somewhere where uh, uh, they can have access to it for their work. And uh, those of you who know that George Jatskovich at the uh, University of Texas Herbarium, that's him in the back left there uh, in the blue. He joined us on uh, this one trip here. So we often in involve local collaborators too. And anybody that presses herbarium specimens knows you need a heat source to kind of dry them quickly. So that's my primitive method there. But let's get to some plants here. This is uh, one of the Blackland prairies uh, near me with some of the Leatris aspera going at it and a lot of really cool stuff here. Um, but this is probably something common to a lot of y'all, one of the um, one of the uh, mountain mints, uh, Pycnanthemum tenuifolium. This is very widespread throughout much of uh, um, the prairies, not just the Blackland prairies, but uh, many areas throughout uh, kind of the eastern half of the US, um, all over the place. But um, Aaron Floden up at um, um, Missouri Botanic Garden, he was mentioning to me about how he really thinks that everything gets lumped into this name is actually a species complex and had noticed uh, some differences with some of the ones he had just uh, briefly seen in, in Texas. And so he was very interested in getting some material for a molecular study because he's been doing a lot of work in this regard with other uh, plant genera and has actually been finding a lot of uh, cryptic species within these groups here that uh, uh, genetically, when you look at the DNA, they are uh, very different, even though they may look close enough or very similar to uh, uh, what the species may look like elsewhere in its range. So you never know what, really what you have in front of you. You can't always just go by uh, all these superficial uh, uh, appearances. Um, it is widely noted, uh, especially with wide ranging species, there are variations and the more, use, the more modern methods that are applied to really uh, um, diving into this, you, you, you start realizing that there may be uh, these new species that have been under our noses all this time that are different from the other ones. And in many cases, that may make them of conservation concern just because suddenly their, uh, what was a very wide ranging species is now broken up and you have this one thing that's only found in one little area. So basically if this proves to be something new, this may be something we need to look at in a different light and uh, be valuing it a little bit more. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what uh, comes out of this. Um, I already did uh, distribute, distribute some material of this to gardens just because it is a popular um, landscape plant anyway. Um, so they, and they do like having documented material as opposed to something you can get in the nursery trade uh, with no known source. So 
Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Had another researcher want this. This is another thing that's uh, interesting, but um, it's fairly widespread. It's uh, one of the. It's in the um, um, the evening primrose family, but uh, kind of a neat plant. It uh, gets up near you all in the Dallas area there, and it's in the hill country. And we have this one little population. Uh, it's very disjunct from most of the other ones there in uh, Walker and uh, uh, Grimes County. And so, and, and that's mainly due to just um, a little island of suitable habitat, which are some Blackland prairie remnants uh, within those uh, um, shaded counties that that arrow is pointing to. And so sometimes when you have these little isolated populations that are disjunct from where the main ones were, Oftentimes, uh, um, those are of importance too, just for those uh, unique genetics. They may have been isolated there for a very long time. This isn't something that just got broken up because of uh, human progress, um, basically destroying the land. This, these, again, were situated there due to the um, geological barriers between the two areas. So um, you never know that uh, a Aside from just being important genetics to have in the grand scheme of things that, uh, again, one day someone may look at them a little bit differently and realize that they've been isolated long enough and maybe have some other parentage in the lines. They may be something distinct. Um, I talked about this earlier, the uh, Linheimer's bee bomb. Um, again, it's uh, on the list for seed banking with the uh, USDA. And uh, I've been... Uh, plotting out uh, places to go for seed collections when uh, Jeffrey Karstens uh, from USDA can come down and do some uh, uh, collecting. But uh, in the process, I started noticing some populations that had some pink ones mixed in. Normally they're white, like the ones on the left here. And just kind of assume these must be hybrids with uh, the other bee balm that we have here and uh, kind of scattered throughout much of the uh, eastern part of the state here, uh, the um, 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 oh my god, I'm drawing a blank. Um, <laughs> I do this sometimes, I'm getting old. Um, basically, the other purple bee balm will come to me in a second, but uh, I just, being that they they are in the kind of general area, I've never seen them growing specifically with the uh, Monarda Lindheimeri, but um, I just assume that there must be some uh, influence, uh, uh, hybrid influence here with these really light uh, pink ones here. But they were still kind of maintaining the, the growth habit of the Monarda Lindheimeri, which tends to run around quite a bit. It's more uh, rhizomatous, it uh, forms uh, large patches um, in these prairie settings here. And so I found three populations, three, three little subpopulations that all had these kind of mixed light pink ones in there. And it just coincidentally, um, a uh, researcher up at Columbia University was interested in hybrid complexes. And so I mentioned these to him and uh, he's working now on these. He's looking at the morphology on these, these are uh, um, basically identical to um, the uh, uh, Lindheimer's bee balm and not, uh, I was hoping the name would pop into my mind right now. Um, Fistulosa. Fistulosa? That's it, yes. <laughs> um, they're, they, they don't, other than the color here, they don't really have any of the morphological features of uh, Monarda Fistulosa. So uh, whether or not this is just, uh, um, that, that's not to say there aren't still some ancestral uh, genetics in there where the color is still expressed, but the other morphological features aren't, uh, we really don't know, but uh, he's gonna include this in his report. Um, he also found that there, has, there was a reference um, in the early 1900s of uh, a Monarda from the, uh, uh, southeastern Texas has very vague uh, uh, locality records, but it was described as uh, uh, Monarda scaperfolia and was described as having light pink flowers when, when alive. Right now it's just an older urbane specimen when that color is not preserved, but uh, 
um, it seems to resemble Monarda Lenheimerine was uh, lumped in that way too. So I don't know, it, again, it's one of those things where you never know unless you really look here. So we're awaiting his uh, DNA uh, uh, studies to see if these are, uh, uh, how these relate to the Lindheimerine that they grow with and uh, uh, figure out where they came from. Another neat one that have down in my neck of the woods here, um, Echinacea, Paradox of Writing Neglecta. You can see on the map here, if you're not familiar with Echinacea paradoxa in a broad sense, it's uh, basically mostly found up in uh, uh, Missouri, some uh, occurrences up in Northern Arkansas. And all the ones you find up there are gonna be basically um, yellow, like the one here on the right. That's how they typically look, ignore the other Echinacea in the background there, but uh, um, paradoxa, variety paradoxa on the right there, again, from that nor those Northern, uh, portions are all yellow. But then once you skip over, uh, just looking back at the map again, you see there's uh, populations in southern Oklahoma, and then there's one county shaded in there, and that's Walker County in uh, southeast Texas here. Um, these are these uh, um, ones that are always uh, colored this kind of dark uh, pink, uh, purpley color. And they re very closely resemble the Echinacea atrorubens that also grows here and grows up in uh, um, your neck of the woods here for the Dallas folks. But um, the way to tell them apart is sometimes like splitting hairs. Um, um, Echinacea paradox and neglecta, the one on the right, they're basically uh, the, the rays are 30 to 70 millimeters, whereas on atrorubens, it's mostly 19 to 35 millimeters. There are a few other in the in the descriptions. There's a distinction supposedly in the uh, hairs on the foliage and the stem, and also the seed morphology. But I've been looking at some of these populations for a while, and they're either very mixed together, or there's uh, many populations where they're just like there's too much overlap in these uh, descriptions. You can find uh, these ones with the long rays side by side with ones that are just classic uh, short rays as in the atrorubens. So it's another one of those things that needs to really be ironed out here. Um, I know Jason Singer has told me there's someone up, uh, I forgot what university it is, up in uh, Texarkana or up somewhere up in Northeast Texas, but uh, he's, I guess, uh, going to be working on Echinacea a little bit more. I know he took them to some of the sites I found uh, down here, even though that one county down there, Walker County, is the only one shaded in on Bonap right now. I actually found uh, uh, more populations in uh, Washington County and all the way down into Colorado County too, as well as uh, uh, Brazos County. So it is more widespread. I think people have just been, again, mistaking these, these for uh, um, Echinacea atrorubens. But again, what uh, we're, we're it, it, it's so hard to really draw the line between these two. Uh, you, we need to go more on just these morphological distinctions. So until then, I think they're both of conservation concern if they are really two separate things, just because both of them, their habitats are really dwindling, especially in the south here. Um, we have a couple prairies in Sam Houston. National forests that uh, have nice uh, extensive populations, but then otherwise it's uh, only roadside roadside sites that I really know of down here. So, uh, and they're all very fragmentary and very. There's really no um, uh, very unlikely that there's any cross pollination between these different populations. So you don't want these Gen X to just become too static here. So these are some of the roadside populations of H. rubens in this neck of the woods here. Well, you might be familiar with that one already. And then we, uh, there's always that question whether or not Echinacea purpurea is uh, in Texas. There are uh, herbarium records um, scattered around the state, but uh, there's been question too whether or not, because uh, some of them are based on scant material and may not actually be purpurea or, um, 
may just be remnants from uh, larger populations. This photo here was taken right over the Louisiana, right over the border in Louisiana. There's uh, a couple of Blackland remnants over there, and they're just everywhere on these. Well, I won't say everywhere, but at least on these little uh, strips of roadside here in the right spots on the right soil, they are just uh, abundant as can be. You can see all the in the background there, all the individual flowers, and they continue down this road for about maybe three quarters of a mile. And then interestingly mixed in them is this, uh, the yellow flowers there, the Rudbeckia lacinata, uh, the cutleaf uh, cone flower. And I think there's only like one record of that in uh, Newton County, in, the, in the, basically uh, the county that's uh, adjacent to uh, the parish that these were found in, in Louisiana. But uh, that's, pretty much it. So it's one of those things we just need to really be looking out for. Here's kind of a comparison of uh, Echinacea purpurea, the ranges, and uh, uh, the Rudbeckia lacinata I just talked about. You can see the uh, Newton County is uh, shaded in there in yellow, meaning yellow means it's a rare occurrence. All the green is uh, means it's characterized as a little bit more abundant, but uh, we really need to see if we can track down some more of those Rudbeckia lacinata in the Texas populations at least and start looking around more for the purpurea too. And some of you may have probably seen the, the what everybody just considers Sable Minor out in a prairie setting. Normally Sable Minor is a uh, uh, more like a floodplain species tend to grow in uh, wet areas but occasionally you do find them on these drier sites um, I never, coming from Florida, this just totally surprised me because even in Florida, which is mostly swamp, you rarely ever see sable miner actually growing up in uh, high dry land like this. Whereas you come out to Texas here, you see them in both situations. You see them along the, uh, the waterways and then you get up in these really high areas, quite some distance from these floodplains and uh, they're doing great out there. Um, I mean, these look a little bit ratty, but that's how plants tend to look as opposed to when we grow them in cultivation, they get cleaned up a little bit better. But uh, there is a, uh, a uh, student who uh, at Cornell University who is uh, um, working to understand better the, uh, what gets referred to as a sable minor complex, because it's been recognized all throughout the southeastern US uh, where all these things that have been called Sable Minor in the past, there's all these kind of unusual uh, uh, regional variations. Some have trunks, some are very dwarfed in size, and some ecologically, like uh, these uh, um, upland ones here, um, also just raise questions too. Even though they all look superficially similar, as we're finding, the more we, again, look at DNA of these things, we actually do have different species sometimes, even though they have been, they just, look exactly the same. So she is very interested in looking at these uh, kind of upland forms here just to see if there's anything that distinguishes them from the ones that you can find in the, uh, the wetter areas. Um, just because it is a, um, a kind of a, a fascinating thing. So again, we may have, who knows, don't want to jump the gun here, but we may have another species right under our noses um, here. And due to uh, um, limited occurrences and kind of maintained prairie areas, it would uh, automatically make it of conservation concern. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, I've been working with uh, Peter Zale and staff at Longwood Gardens up in Pennsylvania with uh, um, a lot of native orchid conservation. Um, there's, of course, other folks in the state here too, they're doing uh, orchid conservation work like uh, Jotsna um, and uh, some other folks, but uh, um, I, a lot of times, again, I'm, uh, uh, well, a lot of those other projects are usually uh, either grant funded or have other sources of funding. Whereas I, again, sometimes just can't help it and I'm doing it on my own time. So, uh, um, a lot of times that's what it really takes to really um, get some of these in cultivation. Um, at Longwood, they have amazing facilities. They have uh, um, 
lots of funding to uh, basically get all the propagation work done. They have great staff. They have lots of space to be growing these things out. And they're interested in sharing back with uh, Texas anything that they propagate uh, that's of interest for restoration. So I really like working with them. They uh, um, have been uh, very generous. And they're also interested in getting some of these things in cultivation, too. Um, some of these things, even though you don't want to transplant these from the wild and they may not establish in your gardens, even if you do try, um, those that are propagated in, uh, in cultivation um, actually do surprisingly well in, uh, um, once they're already uh, um, kind of uh, inoculated with their beneficial uh, mycorrhizae. And so some of these could be garden plants. It's just someone needs to go through all the trial and error of uh, propagating them in a laboratory setting, which is not uh, anything uh, very easy for most people. But he produces these things by the thousands. And uh, even, even if they're not something rare and unusual, I mean, he's interested in still doing local forms of things. So uh, I've sent him things like, uh, y'all might recognize this one. This is one that's common in uh, fall around here, uh, the Spiranthes lacera of Radi gracilis. Um, even though this is common and found throughout much of Eastern North America, um, he's still interested in propagating from these various populations here and was very really interested in our Texas ones. And so now he's got thousands of these as well. And uh, he, he does, uh, even though conservation is uh, first and foremost, the uh, most important aspect of this, they have so many that uh, they do like getting these things into uh, nurseries that would want to uh, be able to uh, promote them and maybe propagate them further, uh, which again, I think is a great thing and uh, maybe opportunities down the road too for uh, those of uh, us who want to uh, do some like prairie restoration. Um, it's not like you can just go to any uh, uh, place that offers things for that purpose and get orchids for that too, but it is part of the diversity that does occur in these Blackland prairies. So um, why not try to figure out a way to make that happen and make these available for uh, um, uh, getting all, all that necessary, necessary biodiversity in there. Another one uh, very rare in the States used to be um, a little bit more common, uh, Spiranthes longulabris. Uh, right now, there's only a couple of populations in uh, um, East Texas. A um, couple of them would qualify as Blackland Prairie. The other ones are more in kind of sandy pineland uh, or what was pineland savanna, but now restricted to roadsides. Uh, they like the roadsides just because they get uh, mowed very regularly again of uh, competing vegetation. Um, but when they mow at the wrong time, it screws up our efforts to uh, um, conserve them. I marked a bunch of these plants here at this roadside site and uh, came back for seeds and they had uh, unfortunately mowed it too early, which uh, is the reality of this sometimes. Um, you can see up in the upper right there, I have the stem flag there to come back to and it got cut off nicely by the mower blades. And But you can see where my dog is there. It's, it's a nice mowed roadside, so we have that at least. But uh, I found that one remaining plant there with the, that was a late bloomer that had the top cut off that had a few flowers left. So hopefully we got some seeds formed on that and dumped out. I wasn't gonna collect those since that was all that um, produced at this site this year, but hopefully next year we can uh, they'll mow at a different time and uh, I have some friends who work for the highway department and they sometimes have influence over that sort of thing. So we'll see if we can make that work again. But uh, one on the hit list this year, which I still have not even seen in the wild yet is Spiranthes brevilabris. Um, there, there is a known population in, uh, in one of the Blackland prairies that is uh, maintained in uh, Sam Houston State Forest. So we're gonna, check those out this year and we've got permission to do so from the National Forest. So uh, looking forward to that. And we're also trying to get uh, access to some private land down in Galveston County too, where there are some uh, recent records of it occurring there. Um, so basically just always going around chasing all these things that need to get in cultivation that nobody else really has funding or 
uh, the drive to do. Um, and then another one here, another just a really conspicuous orchid when it's blooming on the prairie is Calipogon oclomensis. Uh, you might be familiar with our other native Calipogon that is found in bogs, Calipogon tuberosus, but uh, um, oclomensis is different because it's found on uh, much drier sites. Um, oftentimes where there is a little bit of seepage underground, but not necessarily, it's not going to necessarily look like a wet site on the surface here. Um, it is uh, become very, it has become very rare in Texas. It's only uh, found at, a, um, I think about three or four sites or have really only been, uh, um, um, that, that are currently maintained or are the only sites that are currently known. There, there have been some other sites that were known in recent decades that unfortunately weren't maintained and, Nothing has been seen uh, on these in many years uh, due to lack of maintenance. So um, definitely a high conservation value here. And we did uh, collect from two sites this year. They're up at Longwood and they've got, again, thousands of seedlings now. So uh, we are gonna be eventually considering where we can maybe um, replant these. We, we wanna keep them for now kind of near where the populations that were, uh, that they were collected from, but those populations are not really safe sites long term as it is. So we don't want to again repopulate those particular sites, knowing that they may not be there in another 20, 30, 50 years. So we really don't like again moving these genetics to very different places. We want to keep them kind of where they were originally found. So how that works out, we will as yet we will see. And so, as I mentioned before, and as many of you know, orchids for propagation they basically need the the fungi that uh, are in association with the roots, the mycorrhizae, in order to uh, um, basically germinate and start growing. Otherwise, uh, in most cases, there are some exceptions, but in most cases. Uh, you need to have that symbiosis from the beginning here. So when I collect seeds for Peter Zale up at Longwood of these orchids, I also have to collect a root section um, as well. And so it's not as invasive as it sounds. I try to do pretty minimal disturbance where you can just kind of, I just dig down with my fingers. I don't use a shovel or anything where I might damage some of the other roots and I just basically just follow a, a root out and uh, they're usually very fleshy like uh, what, what you see here with the arrow pointing at it and you can just basically uh, um, very carefully cut cut one root segment off and uh, uh, it really is of no detriment to the plant. I've checked plants that have cut roots off uh, in previous years and they flower with no issues the following year and they read they will regenerate them. So uh, um, really not a big deal. Um, sometimes when I bring this up to like, like when I brought this up to Big Bend National Park, when I was getting my permit for collecting orchids out there, they just totally freaked out about cutting a digging and cutting a root. So I have to really explain to people sometimes that it's not as, in, as invasive as it sounds. But basically I'll send that root to Peter and they will in the lab, they will isolate the uh, Pelotons, which is basically uh, little bundles of the uh, the mycorrhizal uh, uh, mycelium that basically uh, enter these uh, um, cells, and uh, they basically will isolate those pelotons and then basically uh, put them on a petri dish with the uh, orchid seeds, kind of like what you see here on the left here. Those are orchid seeds that are actually starting to germinate. These are all photos that Peter had sent me of uh, the process. Um, and then eventually in these petri dishes here, you'll, uh, on the, that, that are on this uh, kind of nutrient media here with the mycorrhizae, you'll eventually get these things that just look like noodles, but those are actually the, um, the little uh, uh, embryonic stages with the roots and everything of these orchids here. And then they're, they're separated out into test tubes. And you can see on the right there, they've already got true leaves that are photosynthesizing. And uh, eventually, once they get to a certain size, they'll be removed from the test tubes and uh, basically hardened off to being out in the open environment. And a uh, number of these sp spiranthes he sent me um, fresh out of the tubes here. And I just was 
really worried about him, but he was telling me they're just really easy. Just pot them up and just treat them like you would a recently transplanted uh, plant and they take off. And sure enough, they did. I had no loss in the hundreds that he sent me and uh, they're just growing in regular potting soil. And uh, um, a few of them were, uh, uh, I, I have Spiranthes parksii on my property here, one of the rare uh, orchids. Uh, Spiranthes orchids, and uh, I wanted to bulk up my population here from the um, plants that I have here. So I put some in pots and some of them I just stuck in the ground and uh, um, hoped for the best. And they, I, I was just totally amazed how well they did. So uh, again, a lot of people think these orchids are really delicate and they are if you do try to transplant them from the wild. So definitely do not do that. But maybe down the road here as these uh, laboratory uh, uh, methods become more efficient, uh, we'll be able to grow them in our gardens as well as have a, a reliable source for restoration. And then this was kind of a cool thing that uh, this is uh, mostly a South Texas species. It's in the uh, uh, Rubiaceae family, which includes like gardenias and uh, coffee and uh, other things, but it's a tiny little plant here that uh, most people would overlook it unless it's flowering. Really beautiful, but you can see with my fingers up there how tiny it really is. Um, I've seen it in South Texas. It also grows in Florida, where I'm from, and I was familiar with it there. But uh, I was looking at herbarium records of it one time and saw that. Uh, Jason Singhurst and the collaborator had collected it in Wharton County, a um, little ways uh, kind of southwest of uh, Houston. And it was kind of a very northerly record uh, from uh, um, its, its main stronghold down again, down in South Texas. And so I went down there and when I was driving by once and found them and they were just in, again, in a little tiny prairie remnant. It was just a little strip of land between a road and uh, a hay field where they herbicide around the edges there. And these were growing like right in that area with it where they herbicide. So they must get knocked back a little bit sometimes, but uh, they, they, they weren't in the more dense, densely vegetated strip because uh, they would just get out competed. So they actually benefit from the periodic herbiciding there. But then uh, just very, just by sheer coincidence, I was, uh, um, I stopped at a roadside uh, little blackland prairie remnant in uh, Washington County, Texas, and sure enough, I found them there too. So uh, that's even more northerly record for them and makes it a blackland prairie plant, which uh, um, makes it applicable to this talk today. So um, again, you never know unless you really get out there and start looking and uh, um, especially in these little uh, isolated segments here. So this is one I want to uh, uh, propagate this year again in one of those little roadside places. Who knows when they're going to widen the road and this little population will be gone. But uh, I really want to keep my eyes out for more now, now that this has significantly expanded their range uh, um, to include uh, a good portion of the state. And another one of those things right under our noses and uh, often occurs in uh, higher quality blackland prairie areas is a, uh, a yucca that uh, has, uh, it originally was named a long time ago, yucca freemanii, but then someone decided to, that it was just no different than our common East Texas yucca Louisianensis. And so basically that freemanii named went away and uh, um, there's been a few old plantsmen that still recognize them as uh, Freemanii here. I never knew that when I moved out here and I started seeing these yuccas that were totally different uh, to me at least from the, from the regular yucca Louisianensis. And sometimes they'd be grown side by side like they are here. The Louisianensis is on the, the right there in the foreground. And that one has those, uh, you can, tell uh, even from uh, afar here, uh, the Louisianensis has that kind of silvery stripe al along the leaf margins, also has those uh, fuzzy uh, filaments, what are called filfers, uh, that are uh, persistent along the uh, leaf margins. Whereas the Freemanii, the one in the back there, it'll have those filifers, but they 
in every single specimen I've seen, they just get shut off very quickly. And so uh, most of the year, they're uh, very clean looking. They don't have the silver uh, edges to the leaves as well. And there's also differences in the uh, the little hairs of pubescence on the uh, flower spikes too, between the two species. So, I mean, there's uh, so many difference between these. I don't know any, why anybody lumped them together in the past. So this is, uh, once I just realized that uh, uh, these eat, these are a different species here that uh, I realized we should uh, really start collecting these and getting these around. And uh, hopefully that'll spark someone to uh, uh, do uh, some of the molecular work to accurately uh, characterize them as such. So that's uh, just kind of some plant uh, nerdery in a nutshell there as it relates to the um, Blackland prairies. Uh, there's a lot more uh, cool things out there that uh, are kind of on my personal hit list and there's a lot of other projects that are in the works once COVID is out of the way and we can have visiting collaborators here uh, that involve both the Blackland prairies and some of the other uh, environments that kind of blend in with the, the Blackland prairies here. But um, I'm doing things all over the state. I'm posting photos all the time on Facebook and Instagram too. If you can't get enough uh, plant photos, you can always uh, follow me on one of those there. And uh, um, it's all about the plants. I have no politics or anything, so uh, it's totally safe. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, if uh, there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer. We actually don't have any questions yet. You've blown us away. Oh, first one. How many acres was original Blackland Prairie in the US and in Texas and how many are left? Oh, as a Florida man, you may not know this, right? Well, it's one of those things I probably should know, but yeah, I, I really don't have an answer for that. Um, um, I mean, it was, as with pretty much all of our uh, um, different ecoregions and uh, uh, unique habitats, I mean, there's, I don't think there's really anything that's still existing in its original state. So, uh, and being that Blackland Prairie is just such a uh, valuable uh, um my power just went out. I'm good though. Um, since Blackland prairies are just such a valuable uh, cropland uh, for the soils there, um, I, I could only imagine that there was uh, quite a bit more um, than there than there is today. Craig would like to know if you sell seeds or seedlings. I don't. Um, I used to have a nursery, but kind of a been there done that type thing and uh, most of my seeds I always prioritize to botanic gardens um, and uh, otherwise just a few nurseries that I know are going to um, for now at least they're going to maintain the records on everything. Um, I don't usually give out mm -hmm. uh, some of this valuable information to places that uh, aren't going to maintain the records. Um, um, generally, it's all just too valuable. Eventually, I mean, these things will uh, get around um, through some of these nurseries, and that's not like they're always going to have the uh, information attached to it. But I want to make sure that these get, um, at least from the beginning, in the right hands, and then um, down the road, um, those can be propagated further. But uh, I mean, so many people are always asking me for seeds. I just can't keep up with it. And uh, uh, especially since, again, I'm always posting on social media. People see all the cool things I'm, I'm getting exposed to. And uh, um, I mean, I, mean I, I think it's great that uh, there's interest in some of these more unusual things. And I, I wish there were better sources for them. And I think there are some on the horizon here. There are several nurseries that are uh, um, starting to get more into uh, a greater diversity. And some of those I am sharing with. So down the road, I think uh, you will see some of the stuff more available. Hey, without the interest, the botanical gardens would probably just ignore it, right? I'm sorry? If there wasn't that much interest, the uh, funding for botanical gardens uh, taking interest might not be there. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's kind of one of those issues, too, as is I've seen in the last couple decades, just um, 
just just being involved in the whole botanic gardens world um there's always this pressure among the executive directors of botanic gardens to be profitable i mean that's obviously logical they got to stay alive but in the process conservation programs are oftentimes the one thing that gets axed or just does not get any uh support at all just because conservation programs really don't um uh, generate any revenue for the garden. It's one of those things that gardens should be doing, but it, it's it's really hard to uh, make money doing that. Basically, um, you can get donations from folks uh, just for for doing good work, but it's oftentimes not enough uh, to really sustain them. So oftentimes, it's really only held together by passionate people that uh, um, that that really keep those projects going. Oftentimes, on their own dime and uh, really doesn't receive support from the higher ups who would rather maybe take all those conservation greenhouses down and put up a, a stage for concerts that they know will make money. So it's, it's, uh, it's really been uh, sad to see a lot of uh, what were really great conservation programs just fall by the wayside. I will say though that I'm really happy that uh, San Antonio Botanic Garden is now kind of ramping up again to really, I think, become I'm a, a leader in the state here for uh, conservation of rare plants. They always had a great program with Michael Easton heading that up there. But um, support was kind of waning in the past several years there. And uh, it was getting kind of scary, but they got a new director now. And uh, she comes from Atlanta Botanical Garden, which is very conservation oriented. So she uh, really understands it and really wants to support it further, which is a really good thing. So. That's uh, one uh, good thing that's going on here. Yes, I think all the chapters got uh, invitations for donations. And so I know Dallas chapter did donate and I know the state donated um, as a whole. Um, so I'm hoping other chapters do the same. Um, Peter, uh, Dr. Shar would like to know if the John Ferry Gardens is still actively doing exit to conservation. Not right now. They're, uh... I'm, I'm still involved with them and I still uh, um, try to uh, just on my own time, I uh, make sure that uh, um, that they're, they're, that all the collections I made while I was there being properly managed, there's a lot of things that need to get distributed to other gardens too. So they're not, so all the eggs aren't in one basket there. But um, yeah, there, ever since the founder died, it's just been, uh, um, there's just been a lot of transition the gardens has been going through and, and since I left as well. So uh, um, hopefully uh, things will be able to get back on track, but also again, they're gonna need uh, support too. They're a nonprofit, they rely on donations, especially COVID now has really hit things uh, pretty badly in terms of uh, nonprofits in general. So um, right now just uh, trying to, um, make sure the staff uh, has a paycheck at the end of the week is uh, their primary concern, but uh, they will be hiring a horticulture director when uh, conditions allow and uh, hopefully can uh, be back um, doing uh, all the great work that uh, has come out of that garden in the near future here. 